Thanks for coming. This is, this is another in our series of the Texas Schools Project and UP Dallas Education Research Center seminars. And we're, we're very pleased today in that we have some connections to the, to the speaker. Rodney Andrews, as you might know, has, has joined us as a uh, full-time faculty member. He's teaching a course a semester over here and then doing a substantive amount of research using Texas education data that we house out at the Education Research Center. Uh, we're, we're excited today. Uh, this is a topic that's of great interest to Texas and to all of the United States. And so we're very excited to see what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of research is being done and what kind of results are, are being found and how we might be able to enhance some of that research. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, as Dan said, I'm Rodney Andrews, a uh, faculty member here at EPS and a researcher at the Texas Schools Project. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Jordan Mazzara, uh, who's an assistant professor at the Policy Analysis and Management um, Department at uh, Cornell. Uh, Jordan does cutting edge work on education, health, and employment as a labor economist. Um, very interested in deploying good research designs to answer important questions. Uh, Jordan has a PhD in economics and public policy from the University of Michigan, where I got my PhD. In fact, I'm at my office here. Jordan was probably where he is right now. <laughs> uh, so please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Jordan here. Um, and I'll let me start. Thank you very much. Um, so as Rodney said, uh, uh, Rodney and I go way back, and it's great uh, to get a chance to come back here, and it's great for a couple of reasons. I was uh, saying uh, earlier, uh, three years ago this weekend, uh, on Texas OU weekend, I got married in Dallas uh, because my wife's uh, family lives here. And um, uh, on that particular weekend, I didn't get a chance to see too much of the game, but from uh, the, the way that people uh, at my wedding were kind of listening to things in their ears and uh, kind of <laughs> reacting with great excitement. I got the impression that it was quite, a, quite an experience, so I'm looking forward to catching a little bit more of it this time. Um, hopefully I'm good luck. I, I think I recall them winning the last time I was in town. So. Are you going to name your firstborn sooner or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> what does it go, what does it go little, the way that these little, ladies would have? He, he's, already, he's already been named. And, uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, I, I really appreciate the invitation to come here and talk, so thank you. Um, okay, so today, uh, uh, as uh, uh, they said in the introduction, I'm going to be talking about some research that I've been doing uh, stemming from work in my dissertation uh, back when Rodney and I were in the same office about uh, the achievement effects of bilingual education programs. Okay. So there's a number of reasons. Uh, uh, I think this crowd probably uh, leads to be less, less motivated than the average crowd that I talk to uh, uh, to care about bilingual education. Uh, one of the reasons is that there have been a large increases in the number of immigrants coming into public schools uh, across the country and the linguistic diversity of that immigrant population has really been changing. So more and more uh, immigrant pools are speaking uh, languages other than English or uh, other uh, Western uh, languages. Uh, and so in particular, there are more and more immigrants coming from the Americas who speak Spanish largely uh, and from Asia who speak um, a variety of Asian languages. And one reason why uh, we might care, um, aside from uh, just sort of uh, uh, reasons related to their education per se, is that language proficiency is a long, uh, strong predictor of economic outcomes later on. Um, and uh, part of the reason that I've come at this uh, with, a, with a background in poverty research uh, is thinking about the ways in which K through 12 strategies can really improve the economic outcomes of uh, immigrant youth. So, uh, poverty rates of limited English proficient immigrants are much higher um, than immigrants who speak English well. Uh, in New York City and LA, you have rates uh, as high as 34% among limited English proficient immigrants, um, uh, whereas there are about half of that uh, for those who say they speak English well. English proficiency is a big, uh, has a lot of explanatory uh, power for thinking about the differences in wages uh, among uh, adult immigrant workers as well. Okay. So while there's a lot, of, um, a lot of reason why we might care, there's really differing views about the role of bilingual education in um, sort of improving educational outcomes uh, for immigrant youth. Uh, and these things, uh, these differing views pretty much go back to uh, sort of the early part of the century, uh, of last century, um, 
Uh, but uh, you can see them manifest themselves uh, sort of starting when the federal government really starts to get active in bilingual education in the 60s and 70s. Um, and the, the two views uh, can be described. On the one hand, uh, this is uh, the, the language that's taken from uh, a Supreme Court case in Lau v. Nichols where uh, a group of Chinese students sued uh, the San Francisco uh, superintendent uh, of the public school system there. Uh, arguing that without any kind of uh, uh, bilingual education, effectively the San Francisco school system wasn't providing uh, immigrants with uh, an equal chance at gaining an education. Okay? So they say there's no equality of treatment merely by providing the same students uh, to immigrant and non-immigrant children who don't um, uh, speak English, uh, understand English well, because uh, essentially if you're not uh, providing some way for them to interpret the same kinds of information uh, in a more meaningful way, then you're uh, effectively foreclose, foreclosing them from a meaningful education. So on the one hand, there's this view that providing bilingual education is really a civil right. It's something that's necessary to ensure that immigrants are able to uh, receive a quality information, quality education. Uh, but on the other hand, there's the view that uh, actually bilingual education programs hurt immigrants uh, more, than, um, more than they help them. Okay? And th there are a lot of uh, sort of less um, well-intended uh, critiques of, the, of bilingual education programs, but I think uh, the one that we should take the most seriously is the critique that bilingual education programs tend to trap uh, immigrant children in a substandard learning environment. So. Um, if you go back to uh, the beginning of the Reagan administration, uh, President Reagan gave a speech um, saying that uh, it's wrong and against American concepts to have bilingual education programs that are openly and admittedly dedicated to preserving uh, immigrants' native language uh, and never getting them adequate in English so they can go out into the, the job market and participate, and participate. So underlying this is really the idea that if you teach kids in their native language, you're sort of putting them in an environment where they're not forced to learn English and kind of assimilate into uh, the language that eventually their labor market success is going to depend on. Um, and so we're really doing them a disservice by um, kind of coddling them, uh, if you like, uh, by, um, by uh, teaching them in their own language. But are either one of these statements based on empirical evidence? I mean, it seems to me that these are emotional statements, not, em not empirical. Very much so. so. I mean, I'll have something to say in a minute about the quality of, of uh, kind of the, the research base on uh, these programs, and, and you'll see that certainly by these times there wasn't very much uh, that was done uh, that would really guide these kinds of decisions. So th I think that's fair, but like I said, there are a lot of uh, critiques of these programs that are purely emotionally based. I think these at least have some kind of uh, well, well-meaning well intention that could in principle be based on, on evidence, even though they might not have been. Um, Okay, so, th so the research questions that I'm going to talk about in my talk uh, are first, and this is uh, a little bit of uh, something that I'll just touch on in passing, are bilingual education programs a trap? So I'll talk about in the district that I'm looking at just the extent to which, uh, you know, putting kids in a bilingual education program really means that they're going to stay there for some long uh, period of time. So critics of bilingual ed uh, often feel that people tend to get classified as bilingual and they never sort of transition into mainstream classes. I'll talk about whether that's true a little bit. Uh, what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about is uh, this question of, is English immersion superior uh, in promoting the achievement of uh, uh, limited English proficient students relative to the counterfactual of receiving some kind of um, language-based supplementary uh, education? And I'll talk a little bit more about exactly uh, what I have in mind. Okay. So those are, the basic, those are the basic questions. Now, just, just before I go on, I want to just touch on some reasons why we think uh, bilingual education might matter. Um, the thing that's normally talked about is just from a pedagogical standpoint or from a kind of science of the mind, science of learning standpoint, whether instruction in the native language is really a superior uh, pedagogical uh, method for teaching uh, immigrant children. And that's one reason why, um, why this might matter. And so a lot of people weigh in on the debate based on this sort of uh, perspective. But there are other reasons why it might matter in practice. Okay? So one of the biggest things, and this is uh, kind of something that's embodied in the Reagan uh, kind of critique of uh, bilingual education, is that the peer effects may be very different for kids uh, in bilingual programs versus kids who are mainstreamed in Engli English-only programs. Okay? So in practice, uh, in bilingual education programs, and this is uh, sort of uh, common across a number of different um, kinds of bilingual programs, it, but in practice they tend to segment off the English language learners into a separate uh, classroom, and so they're surrounded by, in general, kids who are of similar uh, racial background, similar language background, uh, and also uh, are similarly um, 
uh, achieving, okay? And, and in general, ELLs tend to be uh, lower achieving if you're measuring their achievement on sort of English language based tests and so forth. So it might be that uh, putting them in that kind of environment uh, might expose them to sort of, uh, uh, you know, what, what people would call lower quality peers in the sense that they have lower test scores. Uh, then putting them in a mainstream environment where they'll be uh, surrounded by a more diverse uh, and possibly higher achieving set of um, peers. Okay? Another thing that's different is teacher quality. Okay? Um, th it's kind of hard to say. We, we don't know too much about uh, sort of what the quality differences are between bilingual teachers uh, and non-bilingual teachers, but uh, at least it's true that bilingual uh, teachers are more credentialed. They've done uh, a little bit of extra work in most places to get the extra credential to teach bilingual uh, education. And it's often true that there are class size differences between bilingual uh, uh, education classes, classes that are taught bilingually and those that aren't. And these can go either way depending on the context, which district we're talking about and so forth. Okay? So what I'm going to be uh, presenting today are estimates that really combine all of these different things. And I'm going to talk a little bit, hopefully at the end, about uh, how we can learn about which of these mechanisms are really driving the sort of overall effect that we see. But from a policy standpoint, you know, really when we put kids in bilingual classrooms, all of these things are at play. Okay? And from a policy perspective, it's really the combined effect of all of these things that I think are important uh, for us to think about. Question. I was wondering if you can talk a little more about how this bilingual uh, curriculum um, are implemented. So, is it, if the math is going to be taught both English and Chinese, for example, or yeah, let me come let me come back to that okay. in uh, like two slides if you don't mind. Um, I, I have a question too. You know, there's another a, a whole aspect of this, kind of the flip side of it. If, uh, do you have a chance? In, as part of this research to look at English speaking children who are exposed to bilingual pro bilingual environments, dual language learners. Is that part of the research as well? Or the in, topic? in practice in this district, those kinds of programs are very rare. Um, and uh, an interesting thing, I'll, I'll say it now instead of later, uh, an interesting facet about the previous research on bilingual education programs is that programs like the kind you're, you're talking about, these dual language immersion programs, uh, tend to show much more positive effects of bilingual education than uh, transitional bilingual education, remedial bilingual education programs. And I think part of that is really driven by the differences in selection uh, of what kinds of students are involved uh, in those two different program types. Dual language immersion programs are much more popular in more affluent uh, districts and the kinds of students who are uh, in those kinds of programs tend to be kind of selected in a very positive way. They tend to have wealthier parents than the kids who aren't in those kinds of programs. And the opposite is true when we're talking about transitional bilingual programs. And so I think a lot of those selection uh, issues really cloud kind of making, uh, you know, kind of firm judgments about which one of those methodologies is better. Well, that's, in, what, that's why we want you studying it. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to say more. In, in the districts that I'm looking at, the, the, those kinds of dual language immersion programs are almost non-existent. They're not non-existent, but they're almost non-existent. They'll play a very small role in this. In, in practice, I don't have a lot of information about uh, the kids who are in these programs, what exactly uh, the kind of the, the pedagogical um, philosophy is. I don't, I don't know that much about that. Uh, okay, so just a quick uh, outline. I'm going to talk about uh, policy and research background. I want to talk about that a little bit quickly. Uh, research design and data, uh, some empirical results, and then I'll talk. Uh, I'm sure you'll tell me about limitations along the way, and then I want to talk about um, policy implications as well uh, and some kind of directions for future research. Can I, uh, is it common to interrupt people uh, along the way? I, I uh, ask because uh, if you want to interrupt me, please do. I'm very comfortable with that uh, environment and probably... Uh, we'll start uh, looking very self-conscious if nobody interrupts me. Um, uh, okay, a quick glossary. So I, I think uh, probably most people know this, but uh, limited English proficient is just uh, a marker for uh, somebody who's been deemed uh, uh, somebody who's been deemed by a school district uh, to have uh, problems learning in the English language. So generally, this is uh, this is measured by. Uh, when kids enter a school district, they're given a home language survey. If they say they speak a language other than, ho uh, other than English at home, then they're tested for their English language proficiency. Okay? In the district that I'm looking at, um, they're tested uh, in, um, uh, in the English language. The, the test is, uh, has three different components. There's a reading part, a writing part, and then an oral comprehension part. Uh, the scores on all of those parts are aggregated and uh, uh, compared to a norm 
the, what, uh, compared to a norm reference population. Okay, so a norm reference population of English speakers. And in the district I'm looking at, and this is a pretty common rule across other districts in the country, uh, anybody who scores at the 40th percentile of that norm distribution or lower is classified as limited English proficient. Okay? Uh, bilingual education programs, so as I said, there are a lot of different kinds of bilingual education programs. In general, uh, I'm going to say that any program that uses uh, uh, the student's native language to some extent uh, is a bilingual education program. I know that glosses over a lot of uh, complexity across programs. Uh, bilingual education programs, um, uh, in the paper I'm going to divide things into what I'm calling bilingual. Uh, this makes it a little more confusing. And then ESL programs. ESL programs tend to be uh, situations where a student is pulled out of, they're, they're in, mostly in mainstream classes, but they're pulled out of those mainstream classes for a period or a couple periods a day uh, for intensive English language instruction. Okay? Uh, bilingual programs are where the kids are actually in a separate classroom most of the time uh, and, um, and uh, most of the, the instruction is conducted in their native language. Okay? I'll talk about, uh, well, I'll say that now. So one of the questions that Sherry was asking or she brought up uh, um, kind of how these programs actually work, a lot of programs that are supposed to be bilingual are actually very much not bilingual. So I visited a lot of classrooms in this, um, uh, in this district. And uh, in particular, uh, in the district uh, that I'm looking at, there are a lot of Chinese uh, immigrants. And uh, if you visit a Chinese uh, bilingual classroom, uh, almost certainly the, the main language of instruction is English. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's not a lot of uh, distinc uh, distinction made between uh, Chinese immigrant students who speak different dialects uh, within the Chinese language. And so, you know, often you have uh, a group of kids who speak Fukinese, a group of kids who speak Cantonese, and some who speak Mandarin, and they don't understand each, any, they don't understand the other Chinese languages, so most of the language in that bilingual classroom is taught in English. Um, again, there's not a lot of markers in the data that would help me tease out, uh, you know, what exactly is going on in the classroom. Uh, I'm going to uh, call both of these things, bilingual education programs and English as a second language program, uh, English language services, ELS. Okay, so in, in the rest of my talk, I'm primarily going to be focused on uh, t talking to you about what the effect of being in either of these programs is. Uh, I, I don't have slides on this, but a afterwards, if people want to ask me questions, I can tell you about some extra stuff that I've done to look at uh, the differences. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, in terms of background, okay, um, I'm going to pick things up in the 1960s when the federal government began to be involved in language policy in the U.S., uh, but certainly there was a history before this. Um, but in the 60s and 70s, I think it's fair to say that, uh, in general, at the government level, there's a lot of uh, increased support for bilingual education. Okay? Following on the successes of the Civil Rights Act, uh, in 1968, the Bilingual Education Act is passed, uh, and basically this Bilingual Education uh, Act creates a pot of money at the federal government level that school districts can tap into in order to uh, develop um, strategies for addressing the needs of their limited English proficient populations. Okay? So the first Bilingual Education Act really just creates this pot of money and encourages districts to use it to, to help to come up with um, strategies to serve these populations better. Okay? There's no requirement that these things are actually used or that schools uh, do anything specific. Okay? That comes uh, in 1974 in the Supreme Court case that I referenced earlier. Uh, when in this Lau v. Nichols uh, Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court says that actually, um, you know, just uh, uh, having this pot of money is not enough. We're going to require uh, school districts to affirmatively adopt some sort of explicit strategy for serving these populations. And in the Office of Civil Rights uh, Lau remedies, which are really the, um, the marching orders that are generated by the Office of Civil Rights, and they go out and they start litigating a lot of cases with specific school districts, uh, they adopt the view that <coughs> the type of uh, thing that schools should be uh, doing for bilingual students uh, is that they should be teaching kids in their native language. Okay? So they, they interpret the Lao decision as saying that any school district which has a sufficient concentration of, of uh, students who's within a particular uh, language background, so they uh, have language that says in a school district that has above 20 kids uh, of a particular uh, language background within consecutive years of each other in a school district, should provide some bilingual instruction in that language for those kids. Okay? So these set of things really create uh, the bite uh, for school districts to adopt these kinds of programs. Okay? Starting in the 1980s, one thing that I'll mention about this is in, in 1968, uh, they say that um, 
uh, school districts, uh, one of the, the goals of this uh, federal uh, set of funds is for school districts to encourage uh, proficiency in students' native languages. Um, so not just to improve their ability in the English language and so forth, but really to enc encourage bilingualism. So that, that kind of language is really part of uh, the initial bill. Okay. Uh, starting in the 80s, uh, in the Reagan administration, there starts to be some retrenchment in federal support uh, for these things. So the BEA, the Bilingual Education Act, uh, always had these carve-outs um, where a certain amount of the funds are set aside to really foster uh, English language only uh, based strategies for um, educating immigrant youth. Uh, and the amount of the set-aside basically starts to increase starting in the 1980s, and that, that continues through uh, 2000 or so. More and more money is set aside for things like uh, structured English immersion um, programs. Okay. The No Child uh, Left Behind Act uh, uh, kind of creates a number of incentives, uh, some of which involve uh, targets for um, uh, how long students can be uh, receiving uh, bilingual instruction aid, although uh, some of those things were never uh, formally uh, adopted in the Act. Uh, but there's a, a lot of language about how soon uh, districts need to reclassify students and, and schools need to be uh, meeting adequate progress along those lines as well. So a lot of uh, the language in this Act sort of puts pressure on schools to get people out of these programs more quickly uh, than was true before. Uh, and probably the most well-known set of government uh, interventions uh, uh, more recently has been a lot of state initiatives, starting with California's Prop 227 uh, in 1998 that actually bans uh, the use of uh, native language, or it doesn't really ban the use of native language, but it adopts uh, language that says that language instruction has to overwhelmingly be in English. Uh, and there's a uh, kind of burgeoning literature about um, sort of whether that really had the intended effect or not. But, uh, so this is sort of the policy background. Uh, Research-wise, um, in the interest of time, so I'm going to skip over some things, but there have been three national studies. The National Academy of Sciences uh, uh, in 1991 kind of pans all of them and says that they weren't very useful in, in trying to figure things out. There have been hundreds of smaller studies. Okay? So uh, there's, uh, in this field, it's been interesting that there have been a series of uh, four to five um, kind of battling meta-analyses of these hundred studies or so. So the in initial uh, volley in this was uh, an article by, I think, DeCanter and Baker in 1981 uh, the most recent was an article by Jay Green in 1998, uh, and in the interim there were four or five uh, studies that came out, and so Baker and DeCanter start by saying uh, these studies say that nothing works, uh, the next one says no you're wrong, they do work, the next one says no they don't, and then Green says yes they do. Um, now, you know, you can kind of go back and forth between um, those studies and, and think about uh, which of those results you believe. But to me, the really compelling thing about those studies is that all of these studies are very old. Um, so uh, almost all of this, the, I think the most recent study uh, in the lot is conducted in 1988 uh, or so. Uh, and overall, the studies are very low quality. So the, mo the most recent uh, of these meta-analyses, which is uh, in green, uh, says that out of uh, about uh, 75 or so that survived uh, kind of an in initial cut, only 11 of them are really worth even entertaining uh, that they provide any relevant uh, evidence. He ends up saying that, you know, those 11 find on net that uh, bilingual ed was beneficial. Um, five of those studies use random assignment, uh, which is a pretty high quality research design. But again, all of these studies are uh, quite old. Uh, the environment has changed a lot, and so there are reasons to believe that they might not have the external validity that we need to think about the effects of bilingual education today. Uh, only one of the five randomized controlled uh, trials was peer-reviewed. Uh, none have an uh, N greater than 200. They're all pretty small uh, scale. Okay. I want to say something more about those in a minute. Uh, in economics, uh, which is my discipline, there's no real reason to privilege these over the others. Um, uh, there have been a few uh, attempts at this. So Hoxby and Gordon look at the effects of Prop 227. Uh, that paper uh, has never been published uh, for a, a variety of reasons that we can get into if you want. Uh, Lopez and Mora have a paper, and then Angres, Chin, and Godoy look at uh, the adoption of um, kind of Spanish-only instruction in Puerto Rico to see what happens to uh, the effects on uh, Puerto Ricans' ability to speak English. Okay? They, they find that it, it doesn't seem to have had much of an effect. Okay, one thing that I want, <laughs> I was just thinking about this on the way over really, so I thought I'd talk about it a little bit, which is probably a bad idea. Um, but uh, I was revisiting some of these five random assignment studies because in general we ought to believe that they tell us something useful. And a lot of them say that 
uh, the effects of bilingual education were quite high. Um, uh, and certainly by modern standards, the effect sizes that they were finding were quite large. So uh, the biggest of these studies, and in, in my opinion, the, the kind of best quality one, finds an effect size uh, on reading measured in the English language uh, of 0.4 standard deviations, which is quite a large uh, treatment effect. So that their effect on math is something like 0.15 standard deviations, which is also not um, negligible. Um, one thing that I think is interesting about these studies, and, and um, as we'll see later on, I find effects that are mildly positive, a lot smaller than that. Uh, but one thing that's different about these is they start out with a group of, uh, you know, in, in the case of this large study, it's close to 200 kids. They randomly assign them uh, into, I think it's four different classrooms. But one thing that's, that's interesting about that is basically what they do is they take these 400 kids uh, and then they divide them up randomly into a sample. One of the things that that does is get, gets rid of some of the differences in mechanisms that I was talking about earlier. And so most uh, uh, relevantly, in my mind, it gets rid of the difference in peer effects uh, that's present in a non-experimental setting. Okay? So because these kids are all randomly assigned into different classrooms, only the kids in the sample frame are, are randomized. Uh, the kids in the class that's taught bilingually have, on average, the same set of background scores as the kids who are uh, in the non-bilingual uh, 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 treatment modality. And so it could be that they're, they're estimating the kind of pure effect of just a difference in language instruction abstracted from uh, some of these other differences. Class sizes are, are equal across the two as well, so that we don't know so much about teacher quality from those studies. But uh, it could be that they're, they're just measuring the effect of, um, uh, of this difference in pedagogical method, like a, one class is taught bilingually and another class is not. Uh, when I'm doing things, I'm going to be measuring, as I said before, kind of the sum total of all of these things. It could, be, it could very, be, uh, very well be the case that bilingual education is a superior kind of pedagogical strategy in that sense, that bilingual instruction is a better way of, of, of uh, learning for kids, but that some of the pure effects work in the other way to make the effects seem more muted on average. Okay? I think we need to do a lot more work before uh, concluding something like that, but that was uh, kind of intriguing uh, to me to think about them. Uh, okay. I think there's nothing about teachers. I mean, because the teacher, the quality of those teachers, because that in itself can have a huge explanatory. Yeah, I just don't, I just don't know. So the, the study uh, that I'm talking about comes from 78, and it's not discussed in the paper that I have that describes it. But OK. So let me uh, try to slow down and talk about uh, my work. OK. So. The, the, the basic problem uh, in all of the previous studies is really trying to uh, parse out kind of what, so you start out and you're just comparing kids who are in some sort of bilingual program to kids who are not in bilingual programs. Okay? And it's obvious to, to think that you know, these kids are very different from each other in ways that might affect their achievement. Okay? And the most obvious difference is that the kids in bilingual education programs don't speak English as well as the kids who are uh, not in bilingual education programs. Okay? So we need to come up with some way of controlling for those sets of differences, but in general that's very hard because in administrative data sets or in, in other kinds of data, it's just hard to capture all the, uh, the full set of uh, things about kids that contribute to differences. Okay? But in general, there's a lot of reason to believe that uh, if I just compare kids to, uh, who are in bilingual programs to those who are not, bilingual programs are going to look bad because the kids in bilingual education programs, particularly this kind of transitional bilingual education program, are disadvantaged along a number of different um, uh, aspects relative to the kids in mainstream classes. That might also be explaining uh, their relative um, uh, deficit on, uh, on achievement tests. Okay? So what I'm trying to do in this paper is really to come up with a strategy that uh, gets around this problem. Okay? And in the district that I'm looking at, this is very much the case, okay? We have the same kind of rule for allocating kids to bilingual education that I described earlier. Kids are given a proficiency test and there's this, there's this bright line drawn, okay? That bright line drawn uh, between, uh, on the proficiency test uh, that says that anybody who scores above this proficiency level is not eligible for bilingual ed and in fact is enjoined by law from being in any kind of bilingual education program. Anybody below the line has to be, is required by law to be in some kind of bilingual education program. In principle, parents are allowed to petition out. In practice, nobody does. Um, what that means is that there's really there's no similarity in the set of kids who are in bilingual programs to those who are not in bilingual programs in terms of their initial language proficiency. Okay? Initial language proficiency, we think, is a big predictor of subsequent achievement test scores. Okay? So if it's really true, 
Okay? If you think from a methodolo methodological standpoint of the kinds of uh, 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 ways of measuring the treatment effects of different kinds of programs, we always want to find people in some treatment group that are similar, uh, hopefully in every way, uh, to somebody in the, in the control group and use one's outcome as a counterfactual for the other. This method of determining who's eligible for bilingual education and who's not eligible really means that just that's a non-starter by design, right? There's no overlap in the, the initial measured language proficiency of kids in bilingual education and those not in bilingual education. And what, and what that means is that any attempt uh, to sort of get at an overall picture of how all the kids in bilingual ed are, are faring relative to all the kids out of bilingual ed is just not going to work without some pretty strong uh, assumptions that we impose on the data. In practice, there are a lot of reasons to believe that those kinds of uh, techniques uh, aren't very effective. Okay. So one uh, kind of uh, uh, pessimistic way to describe what I'm doing here is, is I'm settling for less. Okay? So rather than focus on all the kids who are in bilingual programs and try to estimate an effect for all of them, I'm going to focus on a particular subset, and I'm going to focus on a subset that I think uh, I can actually find a, an appropriate counterfactual group for among the subset of kids who are not in bilingual programs. And the way that I'm going to do that is to, to, to make use of that eligibility threshold rule that I just described. Okay? So uh, for those of you familiar with the evaluation literature, this is, this is something called the re uh, regression uh, discontinuity design. Okay? And basically, we have uh, this... Um, uh, this initial language assessment test score that's given to all kids who say that they speak a language other than English at home. Okay, they're tested and everybody who scores at the 40th percentile uh, or below is eligible and required to be in some sort of bilingual education program. Everybody above is ineligible, they're not. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, in general there's no overlap here, but as long as there's some randomness in this test score, right? And I told you before that the test score is comprised of your scores on these three different components. Each of the different components has a number of different uh, uh, items that go into it. And so we can think of, at some level, the kid who scores uh, at the 40th percentile is probably, whoops, uh, is probably not all that different from the kid who scores at the 41st uh, percentile. Okay? If that assumption is true, if it's really true that these kids who are scoring just below the threshold, 39-40, aren't that different from the kids who are scoring just above, 41-42, okay? then I can use th those two groups uh, as the groups that I focus on to think about what the effects of bilingual ed are. Okay? So everybody in the 39th and 40th percentile, for the most part, is in some sort of bilingual education program. Uh, everybody who scores up the 41st and 42nd uh, is not in those kinds of programs. And so if I compare their scores uh, to each other, uh, their, their scores on achievement tests measured later on, and if I find a difference, uh, then it's going to be at least uh, very likely that those differences in test scores were causally produced by being in one program or another. Okay? It's not these other differences that are, uh, that are uh, producing, uh, that are biasing my results. Okay? The nice thing about this design is that I can at least give you some information about whether you should believe me that uh, kids below the, this threshold are really are similar to kids just above, and I'll do that. Okay. So we can look at the observable uh, characteristics that we measure about people, and I can really tell you just the extent to which kids at the 39th and 40th percentile do look similar to the 41st uh, and 42nd uh, uh, percentile kids. How many students that are... Uh, that said their English is speak, spoken at home scored below the 40th percentile? Uh, I'm going to make up the number that's kind of plus I mean, or minus 8%, yeah. right? It's, it's about 65%. So that could be a nice comparison group, too. Oh, forgive me, tell, say that again? Those who's, who, who said their home language is English but started out below the 40th oh, oh, percentile. Oh. If your home language is English, uh, you don't get this language assessment. Uh, they, so so I, I can't. I don't know that. Um, okay, so let me describe the data. So the data come from a, a large urban school district in the Northeast, uh, uh, Les Denis, as I'll call it. Uh, so I have administrative student level data uh, for all students while they're in grades three through eight. Okay, so this is not uh, ideal in the sense that it, for bilingual ed, a lot, you know, there's a lot of reason to believe that earlier uh, experiences might be better, and I don't have a lot of data on that. Um, so this is uh, kind of taking kids who are already in bilingual education programs as of grade three and kind of looking at uh, the effects of continuing in those kinds of programs or not. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of data. Um, so I have data on this language achievement test score uh, from 98 through 2002. Uh, there are subsequent achievement tests in the following year in math and reading. Uh, and then uh, a fair amount of demo the, the kinds of demographic information that are normally in uh, these kind of administrative data 
um, plus uh, some uh, census zip uh, code in information that I can use to link up to um, sort of census characteristics of the neighborhood in which they live. Okay, so that's um, the demographic information. For this uh, study, I'm going to be using uh, all students who um, are at risk for needing uh, English language services, which means that they answered yes, uh, a language other than English is spoken at home, um, and remain in the, the school system for at least a year after they take the test and are not new entrants into the school system. Okay? So that yields about 183,000 uh, um, student years worth of information. The number of uh, unique students is about half of that. Um, I, I should say that th these kinds of sample rules uh, diminish the sample a little bit. You might worry about things like uh, if, a, if a kid is not classified uh, as, a, as a, a limited English proficient and the parent really wanted them to be, uh, maybe they move uh, into another district to, to find the services they need. That kind of behavior doesn't uh, appear to be going on. I can talk about how you uh, verify things like that if anybody's interested. Okay, just to give you a sense for um, what these students look like, I'm guessing this table is not le uh, legible past the second row or so, but uh, if you look at, uh, so these are reading z-scores, the, the norming is done relative to the overall population of test takers, not uh, of all students, not just the students who took the, the test. So you can see that in reading, uh, everybody who responds that they, they speak a, a language other than uh, English at home is about uh, six-tenths of a standard deviation below the mean. Uh, in math, about four tenths. If you look at the differences between uh, those who end up being classified as, uh, as limited English proficient and so end up in uh, some form of ELS, uh, those guys are about eight, uh, almost nine tenths below the mean in reading uh, compared to about two tenths below uh, the mean for ELS. Okay? So that's a difference of about six, uh, 0.64 standard deviations. Okay? So that's kind of the most naive uh, way of estimating the effect of bilingual education programs, right? Just come up with a simple difference in the reading scores between those in bilingual programs and those not. Um, but, uh, you know, as I've argued already, that's probably not an appropriate comparison because of all the other differences between uh, these groups. And you can see there's a difference in uh, the fraction who are eventually promoted to the next grade. Uh, in my sample, I've got about 15% Asian. Uh, the majority are, are um, Hispanic, 70%. 5% uh, black, 8% white, mostly Russian. Um, very poor uh, district overall and a poor community. 96% uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. Uh, uh, about 47% are foreign born. This is one of the big differences between those who end up in English language services and those who don't. Uh, the, those in English language services are quite a bit more likely to have parents who are to be foreign born, to have immigrated uh, into the US compared to those um, uh, who are not in English language services. Um, and uh, and uh, the home language being English. So you can see that those who are uh, in ELS tend to be uh, more likely to be Hispanic relative to being Asian um, uh, or from other uh, linguistic backgrounds. Okay. Other questions so far? What are the ends? Okay, so uh, uh, what are, the, are the groups about equal size? Of ELS and ELS. Non -ELS. No, not at all. So uh, non-ELS. So th this is of the, the set of people who are tested for language assessment. So the, the kids in my sample all said that they speak a language other, th other uh, than uh, English at home. So you have a hundred and something thousand, but how many are in each of the two groups? Uh, about two-thirds and a third. <clears throat> So not reliable, not, not directly. Uh, proxies, I might be able to come up with proxies, but I, I'm not sure I'd be able to distinguish. I was thinking about things about, uh, there's information about who filled out different forms for the kids. Uh, I think that's probably a rough proxy, but it's not a, it could well be proxying for other measures of class and so forth. Professions, educational level. So, so what's the overall end on the ELS again? Overall end? Yeah. Uh, two thirds of 183,000, so. Yeah. All right. So what I'm what I'm going to talk to you about for for the the majority of the talk, I'm just going to focus on one particular grade uh, level to make things a little bit more manageable. Uh, so as I said, I've got kids in grades three through eight. At the end, I'll talk about some uh, sort of differences across grade level. Um, 
but uh, this, this is uh, just an illustration of um, the research design that I'm talking about. And most of what I'm going to show you for the rest of the talk are these kinds of pictures. Okay? So uh, I like this kind of presentation because you can sort of see what my data look like. Uh, hopefully you can see uh, the treatment effects uh, that I'm finding, the effects of bilingual ed or the, the non-effects that I'm finding, and kind of judge for yourself whether you believe them. Uh, let me just explain the picture. So the picture is on the x-axis is your uh, score on this language assessment test. Okay, so it ranges from zero uh, to, um, to uh, 99, essentially. Uh, I've just normalized this, so zero corresponds to the 40th percentile um, cutoff point. Okay? So people down here uh, have ex essentially are in the first percentile. People up here are in the 99th percentile. Each one of these dots corresponds to the average of some uh, characteristic about the people in the sample uh, who scored in that particular percentile. Okay? So for example, uh, what I'm showing with these circles here are just the overall proportion of, of these students who took the test and scored in the relevant percentiles who uh, end up in some form of English language service. Okay? So what you see is that uh, about 90% of all the kids who scored in the first percentile uh, were in um, uh, some form of English language service. And that fraction is pretty much constant as you go up uh, to get to you know, the, f the 40th percentile right at zero. Okay? That drops uh, almost down to zero right away. Uh, with uh, some very small uh, exceptions. Okay? Now, uh, what I'm going to present to you is only kids uh, who take the test um, going into grade four. Okay? Uh, you can think about the, the smallest sample size in any one of these bins is somewhere around uh, 300 students or so. Um, as you go in this direction, there are more people, uh, in, uh, there are more people uh, in the sample than that. Uh, another property of this data that you'll see is that the, the kind of categories of test scores get more, uh, get kind of farther apart. So you can see that the dots are, get farther apart from each other out here. Uh, and basically what's happening is that um, uh, there just aren't enough uh, students who are scoring uh, in ranges like this, and so the data is binned up. Uh, so the way the data is binned up gets coarser and coarser as you go out into the right-hand uh, side. Okay? But what this picture is showing is exactly the research design I described. People who score below the 40th percentile are almost all in bilingual ed programs. People above uh, are almost all not. Uh, these triangles show the fraction of kids who are in uh, a program classified as bilingual. The pluses show the fraction who are uh, in some kind of ESL program. Okay? So what I'm going to show you is just the effect of being in one or the other. You'll see that that's primarily driven by ESL, partly by uh, bilingual um, programs, although the differences between the programs don't appear to be that large. It's less than 100%, right, the fraction participating? Yeah. Because you said people can opt out. Yeah. In absolute numbers, what number are we talking? The kids who were eligible but opted out, or the parents had them opt out? So around, so there, there are probably about 600 kids who, or I'm sorry, there are about 300 uh, kids or so in this category. Uh, people who score in the, I think it's the 39th percentile in this particular grade. So there may, might be 39. So not enough right. to really do a, do a comparison. Of those who? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, right. No, I understand what you're getting at. But I, so I actually think uh, the more I've talked to the district, the more I'm convinced that this is classification error, not real. I see. Um, okay. Before they are placed in bilingual, are they given any test in their uh, no, that native language? In their native language. That used to be the case. So it used to be the case in this district that there were two tests given, one in your English language and one in your native language. And an additional criteria to being placed in a bilingual class is, is that your kind of measured achievement in your native language had to be higher than it was in. But that, that's no longer the case. They don't test in the kids' native languages. So those who are below zero, they could be below the there could be, percentile in any language. There could be learning, other learning difficulties aside from Okay. The, the, you know, what this research design is resting on is that there aren't those kinds of differences if I compare people just above and just below the threshold. Okay, so these pictures are nice and let you see things, but in general we like to have numbers associated with uh, the, the gaps that we see. Uh, and so what I'm doing is just fitting uh, polynomials through uh, these lines. We can talk about how uh, to estimate these things more if you like. Um, but uh, for the moment, uh, just take my word for it that the gap in uh, English language services is about 0.9, so about a 90 percentage difference, uh, 90 percentage point difference between uh, being in uh, the likelihood of being in uh, some form of program uh, just above and just below the threshold. Wow, the time goes fast. Um, 
Okay, so the first thing that I said I was going to talk to you about was just um, what happens, uh, whether people tend to stay uh, in bilingual programs or not. And um, one of the nice things about the data is that I can follow these people over time. So this is uh, the, where, what program you're in one year after taking the language assessment test. If we go two years after, we see already that uh, whereas this was 90% of the kids classified, this falls to uh, about 40% uh, one year later. Uh, three years later, this falls down to about uh, 15 or 16 percent, uh, and uh, if we kept going uh, for four or five years later, almost all of these, or I think four is the, the max I can do, almost all of these kids are gone uh, by that. So to some extent, I think the concerns about kids staying there forever are, are uh, not very warranted. Um, you know, you have uh, uh, kids out here who, whose measure language proficiency was quite low who are, are more likely to be there, but that's already fallen quite a bit from the 40% as well. Uh, but let me get to the, to the main course. So the main course is, um, uh, is uh, looking at reading achievement. Okay? So now what would we expect to see about, uh, about this line? Okay? So remember that all the kids uh, to the left, or almost all the kids to the left are in some form of English language service. All the kids to the right are not. And uh, so as a result, what we'd expect is that if bilingual programs really do improve achievement, what we'd expect to see is that if we compare these kids who are just above the line, and if we think they're really similar in most ways that affect their achievement levels to those who are just below the line, okay, if bilingual education has a large positive effect on achievement, we'd expect to see this dot being higher uh, than this dot. Okay? And if you kind of extrapolate the line to thinking about what the student who scored right at the same percentile would be, it appears that that's actually true, that there is a kind of a discontinuity in this overall trend where, you know, if you were going from right to left and so all of a sudden you became eligible for bilingual ed, your achievement does jump up. Okay? That's essentially the way that this technique is going to measure the effect of bilingual education. Okay? Um, now, uh, one kind of uh, uh, reason to, to uh, kind of wait a minute before see, uh, saying, you know, bilingual education programs work and so forth, I, I haven't shown you what the number is uh, yet, uh, is if you look at this. So this is the fraction of all kids who are tested. Okay? So not everybody uh, who's classified as limited English proficient is required to take uh, the achievement tests. And schools are allowed some discretion in uh, deciding what fraction of their limited English proficient pool to test. Okay? It looks like schools actually use that discretion in this way. Kids who are classified as limited English proficient are less likely to take the test. Okay, these are kids who are essentially the same in terms of measured language proficiency. Okay, but uh, kids who um, are just below the threshold are about 15, I think, percentage points less likely to be tested. Okay? Now, you can imagine okay, in a high stakes environment uh, where uh, schools are given rewards based on what fraction of their kids are passing tests and so forth that this might not be random. <coughs> um, so if uh, we just go and add uh, kind of estimates to what these lines are, we're measuring a, a, a kind of effect of bilingual education of about 0.1 standard deviations, uh, which seems good until we see that, it, like I said before, there's about a 15 percentage difference in the fraction of people who are tested. Okay? So what would you expect? You'd expect that maybe it's true that uh, districts exempt uh, the kind of worst, the people who they think are least likely to perform, least likely to perform, the people who they think are uh, uh, likely not to perform well on tests. If that's true, that would have exactly this kind of effect, right? It would, it would uh, pull up the line. Okay, so I've done some tests about whether that's true. Uh, the test is a little bit complicated, but let me try to give you uh, the intuition. Uh, if the story I'm describing is true, okay, the bigger is this gap, right? The bigger a corresponding positive effect you'd expect to find, right? The more kids they're exempting who are limited English proficient, maybe the more uh, it's, they're sort of do, getting rid of uh, the lower uh, tail of the distribution, the more of those kids they drop out, the more that's going to push up the average test score. Okay? So if you plot that, that's what I have in this figure. So this is the size of that gap that you see, and this is the measured effect size that I see. So what I've done is I've divided up uh, the data by grade. Uh, so I have uh, six different uh, six, wait, five different grades uh, over four different years. So there are 20 different uh, estimates of uh, treatment effects. So this uh, additionally has uh, kind of grade and year fixed effects in it. Uh, but uh, the treatment of uh, the effect size is plotted against um, the gap that you see and the, the fraction tested. And you see overall that there's not really a strong relationship as we would have um, uh, predicted if that uh, kind of gaming, or if that behavior really did reflect this kind of gaming of the test. Okay, so it's not obvious that um, it's not obvious that, you know, why this is 
happening. Or, I mean, I think it's obvious why it's happening, but it's not obvious maybe that uh, districts are doing a good job of identifying who would do well and who wouldn't, uh, or you know, maybe, maybe an entirely different dynamic is going on. Uh, can you go back to that slide? No, the one <coughs> If that was true, you would expect that that the triangular line to be flat. Just the fact that the triangular line has a slope means that they, they have some information about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That itself suggests that lower you I start, agree. the less you get tested. I agree with you. So, so there is some effect there. Well, yes, but I, but I, you know, l let me come back to that. I want to. Uh, I've done a bad job of managing time here, and I want to try to get to some of the the, the main results here. Um, but please, let's talk afterwards. Um, one nice thing is that rather than really modeling that process, uh, if you just look a couple of years later on in the data, actually that testing gap goes away. Okay? So s districts are allowed some discretion, but they're not allowed pure discretion. Okay? After a certain number of years, all kids have to be tested in the, in the English language. And if you look just two years after that language assessment test, there isn't that gap anymore. Okay? Now what you see here is, uh, again, uh, uh, the, the effect size has actually gone up a little bit. Now, you might quibble with the particular fit that I've shown here, um, but uh, I'll ask you not to fixate on that uh, right away, um, but we'll come back to that later on. So a lot of these results are, are um, robust to um, changing that line and changing the estimation technique in ways that that doesn't happen. If you look at uh, uh, achievement uh, measured three years after the test, again, uh, about a 0.1 uh, effect size, uh, not statistically significant. Um, for math, uh, the overall uh, effect is, is much, much smaller. Okay? So in almost all cases, the, the size of the math effect that you see is uh, close to non-existent. So I'm showing you just, again, grade four, two and three years after, um, ignoring the grade one effects for now. Okay. okay. Um, I, I want to throw this out there uh, just because uh, I'd, I'd really love to hear anybody's insights on this um, kind of puzzling uh, finding that I have. Okay. So overall what I'm finding is that it looks like there is uh, some relatively small effect of bilingual education. I'm going to come back later and show you that it looks like I'm finding about uh, you know, estimates that are about 0.1 standard deviations for reading, about 0.02 uh, for, for math, which, is, which are both quite small uh, relative to the evidence in the literature. But I told you before that you could test this assumption that the kids on either side of the cutoff really are similar to each other. Okay? Now, one of the things that you worry about is, you know, th think about why the kids might not be similar to each other. Okay? They might not be similar to each other. One reason is uh, if people are able to kind of finely manipulate their test score. So let's say that um, uh, at some stage of the process, either a student is able to say, like, I know I really want to get a four, uh, 41 because I want to be... Uh, I really want to make sure that I get out of uh, bilingual ed. Okay? And so, but after I get a 41, I don't really care what my test score is after that. I, I'm just going to stop answering questions when I know I've gotten a 41 or something like that. It might be, you know, a more cynical view might be uh, that at some stage in the process, uh, somebody's grading these tests, they see that this particular kid got a 39, but they really know he'd be able to hack it just fine outside of the system. And so they erase his 39 and they write in a 41. If that kind of manipulation of the test scores is possible, okay, and I, I have to say that honestly I don't see that it's obvious that it is possible, but the data kind of speak to that issue. Okay? If you look at this density of test scores, okay, this is just the fraction of the sample who took the test who score in any one of those categories. Okay? These, these zeros down here just correspond to a category that wasn't possible based on the test. The, the data is just coarsened in a way that don't allow you to see that. Um, what you see here is, you know, a lot of these kids are scoring at low levels, the density's coming down, okay, all of a sudden here you see this big jump up, okay, and uh, then it goes down again. Now, there's not a lot of reason a priori to think that the distribution of initial language ability really has this bump in it right at the 40th percentile, so it really does look like there's something strange going on with regard to uh, manipulation of uh, these language assessment uh, scores. Now, um, I don't really have time to get into this as much as I'd like, but uh, I've talked to a lot of people in the district. I, I have to say that I think that 
uh, finding this bump really goes against the incentives embedded in the systems for schools. Right? So if you think it's a school level story, most schools get more money if they have more uh, limited English proficient uh, students uh, in, in a classroom. The exceptions are when like having a few extra LEPs would involve creating an additional classroom and so forth. If you look at schools that uh, are kind of right around that margin, this effect doesn't appear more pronounced than it does in other schools. And so that doesn't seem to be such uh, a major factor. And I really think this uh, goes against the, the preferences of most educators in the system. Uh, who uh, tend to, to feel, in my uh, experiences talking with them, that for kids right around this margin, it'd be better to have them in the classes than uh, out of the classes. So I, I have a really hard time explaining uh, why this behavior exists. Okay, this is just putting numbers on the, the magnitude uh, of this density. I won't talk about um, the details. But uh, the fact that it does exist really raises the possibility that you know, again, this kind of changing of test scores is non-random with respect to the characteristics that affect, uh, or, or affect our measured treatment effects. Um, and so we need to worry about what exactly is going on, okay? If, how, how much uh, leeway can I take with uh, the time? You started about five or 10 minutes late. Yeah. We'll so forgive me, forgive me for going over. But, um, uh, it's five minutes is okay. Um, uh, so what, the basic thing that we're worried about is that if this behavior is non-random, so if, if there are certain uh, students whose test scores for whatever reason kind of should have been 39, 40, they should have been eligible, but they end up getting bumped up to uh, uh, 41 or, or something like that, what students is that happening for? Okay? So if we look at the characteristics, okay? so this is the graph where uh, ideally I would show you lines that all perfectly intersected each other through this cutoff, meaning that students on either side of the threshold really were observably similar in every way. Right? That would give us a lot more faith that, even though I can't see everything about kids, if they're observably similar in every way, maybe they're similar in terms of the things I can't see too. But that turns out not to be true, okay? So there are some important determinants of test scores that are uh, pretty smooth through that cutoff, uh, like free lunch eligibility. Um, uh, in the fraction foreign born is relatively smooth as well. But the one thing that really stands out is that this phenomenon appears much more pronounced for uh, kids whose home language is uh, Spanish rel uh, relative to others. And uh, I think I said before that uh, relative to the other Asians and uh, Russian uh, kids in the sample, the Spanish kids tend to be uh, lower, the score lower on achievement tests. Okay? So what that means is that the fraction just below uh, here is uh, likely, for other reasons, besides just the program, to score lower on these tests than they might have otherwise. Okay? So uh, what do we say about that? So one thing we say about that is that's kind of a bummer from the standpoint of the design. We really hoped that this was going to get rid of the differences. Okay, but at least this design helps us to think about the direction of the biases that are uh, implicit in the estimate that I have. Okay? So the estimate that I have isn't controlling for any of these differences so far. Okay, so if I didn't know anything else about these people, I would say that uh, these kids are likely to be lower performing uh, for other reasons outside of whether they're in bilingual ed classes or not. What that means is that my estimate is probably kind of biased downwards in terms of uh, the true um, causal effect of bilingual education programs on uh, achievement. Okay? There are a lot of different ways to address this. This is um, something methodologically that I'm, that I'm working on. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk uh, with people afterwards about those different techniques. Uh, the kind of easiest thing to do is just uh, to additionally control for these covariates that I can see. Okay? So I'll present you those, um, uh, those results. The other techniques that I've tried give you roughly uh, the same kinds of answers. Um, but overall, so this is now uh, adjusting the previous estimates that I showed you on the graphs for these covariates uh, and others, the, the zip code information and so forth that I have about people. Uh, and what we see overall is that the results are relatively robust to that, okay? So uh, reading, this is grade three through grade seven, you don't see the kind of strong uh, sort of association with grade level and the differences in effect size. If anything, it goes down a little bit um, uh, as the kids get older, okay? So the overall estimate uh, that I have is 0.08. So that's just a, 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 a variance weighted average, inverse variance weighted average of all of these uh, effects is 0.08 standard deviations for math. Uh, it's 0.03. Okay. So that's uh, sort of the bottom line uh, of the study. Let me, let me touch on the policy implications really quick uh, and then talk about some limitations in future work. So I think that the, the, the results here are really most relevant for thinking about uh, policy that tends to uh, kind of accelerate 
um, the rate at which kids are reclassified uh, and what the likely benefits for children are of doing, that, uh, of doing that are. I say that because the results that I have here are really most applicable to kids who are right at the margin of uh, eligibility. Okay? So it's probably most appropriate to think about anything that would push kids who are right at the margin of eligibility out. Um, I think the estimates that I have are pretty directly applicable to them. And you know, what I have in mind are exactly these kinds of things, pushing kids who are right around the margin uh, out. So I think suggests that the achievement effects are probably negative for those kinds of policies. Okay? So they might not be a good idea. Now, what do we think about what my evidence tells you about what the overall effect of bilingual education, not just for kids at the margin, but for you know, all these kids who are scoring at lower levels as well. Now, I don't have direct evidence about this, and so you have to kind of invoke some, uh, some outside reasoning. I think it's reasonable to believe that the effects of English language services are probably correlated with your initial language ability. I think they're probably correlated in the sense that the worse you speak English, the better bilingual education programs are for you. Uh, you know, that's kind of the rationale for why we don't give kids who speak perfect English uh, bilingual education uh, programs. Um, so that seems to be a pretty reasonable assumption to me. If we really believe that's true, then again, I think the estimates that I have are, are kind of a, a floor, like a bottom floor for what we'd expect to see in the overall population. Okay? So basically, I'm bounding the effects uh, below at about 0.08 for reading uh, and 0.02 for, um, for math. The, the, the true effects on the overall population, I think, must be larger than that. Um, okay, suggesting that a ban on uh, English language services might not be a good idea either. Um, okay, uh, maybe I should stop here. I'll, I'll just kind of say that in, in general, this is ongoing research. I'd really appreciate um, more of your feedback on it. The, the big things that I'm trying to push on now are uh, looking at this in different contexts uh, and for different sets of outcomes. So getting data on kids uh, going from when they first enter the system through to measuring things like graduation outcomes, persistence in school, uh, college education, looking at uh, labor market outcomes like wages, I think it'd be particularly interesting to see whether kids in these kinds of programs are more likely to assimilate in other dimensions, like uh, whether you work in an ethnic enclave or uh, kind of ethnic dominated uh, occupation, uh, other measures of civic integration and so forth. But I've uh, kind of outlasted my welcome by at least 10 minutes, so let me, uh, let me stop there. seminar, all the questions have been asked and probably not answered. Um, but I, I, again, I think we want to thank uh, Dr. Matsudara for coming in and uh, uh, bringing uh, some economics to a very important policy question in a way that I think is relevant to people who are not economists and, is, and people who are interested in, in bettering education to make sure that the benefits of education uh, reach all segments of society. Um, so uh, we really appreciate that. And I'm sure he's eager to uh, hear your questions. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.